Hello and uh, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 7th of June in this month's non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to do um, a little bit of housekeeping. So a disclaimer for uh, compliance purposes. So what I can't do is give financial advice with respect to where to buy, where to sell. What I can do is obviously outline key areas of support and resistance. Purpose of this is obviously to cover the non-farm payrolls numbers for May and hopefully determine whether or not um, the dollar, having been under pressure for most of this week, is likely to go higher or lower. Also, what we have seen thus far this week is a significant a bid up in bond markets uh, on the back of um, on the back of uh, concerns or not concerns but expectations that we may well see um, further easing of monetary policy or a resumption a resumption of easing of monetary policy over the course of the second half of this year. So I think when we when we look at the last few weeks, we've seen much weak. We've seen a significant decline in stock markets overall. Um, but we do appear to now be starting to find a little bit of support on the back of perhaps an expectation that people feel that the glass is half full and not half empty. If we look at the gains that we've seen thus far this week, the S&P 500 has rallied for five days in a row, which coming off the back of the declines that we've seen in recent weeks is welcome news. Um, but the big question is, is it a resumption of the moves higher that we've seen over the course of the past few months? We saw four positive months in a row. May was the first negative month this year. Was May an outlier or was it the beginning of um, a resumption of the move that we've seen since the beginning of the year. Well, there's a number of factors at play. Obviously, the risk-off mood that we've seen since uh, the beginning of May has been reflected in US bond yields. Now, this is a US two-year yield, which is down around a bit below 2%. And what you're looking at now is a US 10-year yield. Now, yields have come off quite substantially um, Yields have come off quite substantially in the past few weeks, um, which means that the, the bond market is essentially pricing in the prospect of a, a potential easing of monetary policy from the Federal Reserve. Now, if we look at um, Fed funds expectations, which is this chart here, and hopefully this will answer some of the questions that you've been asking me um, in the lead up to this recording. If we look at this column here, which is the rate cut probabilities. It's WIRP on the Bloomberg terminal. Um, and I'm hoping that you can all, all hear me um, as, as I'm speaking as I'm speaking to you. The WIRP basically outlines the probability that bond markets are assigning for, to a potential Fed rate cut. Now, obviously, there are um, press conferences now at every single Fed rate decision this year. That was something that was changed by Chairman Powell at the beginning of the year. And markets are assigning a 93.6% probability that the Fed will cut rates in September. They're also assigning a significant probability that they'll go in December as well. So markets are essentially pricing in two Fed rate cuts by the end of the year. Now, I think that is way overdone. Um, whatever you think about the global economic picture, the US economy is still significantly divergent from that, um, particularly if you look at the services sector and the services ISM numbers that we saw earlier this week, but also the PMIs as well. Numbers in the mid 50s are still fairly decent. Um, we are talking about a potential Fed rate cut in three months time. For that to happen, you would have to think that the wheels are going to fall off in a major way. Now, at the moment, I don't see that happening. We did see a disappointing ADP number on Wednesday of 27,000, which was 
the lowest reading in quite some time. But I'm never a big believer in assigning too much weight to one month's number. You may recall in February, non-farm payrolls posted a 33,000 number and then rebounded to 263, uh, re rebounded to 300,000 um, in March. So ADP is disappointing. It may be a leading indicator for a rather disappointing headline payrolls number for um, 10 minutes time. But um, unless we come in significantly below 140,000, I would expect the dollar to rebound a little bit uh, on the back, or especially ahead of the weekend, given um, how far um, we've rallied in bond markets this week. And we are now starting to rally in equity markets. So I think we've seen a rally in equity markets. We haven't seen bond markets come off. Yields are still at fairly low levels. So I think the key thing for me um, today is either bond markets are right or equity markets or if US equity markets are right in terms of we've seen a little bit of a sell off but overall while the slowdown in expectations is disappointing it's unlikely that the wheels are going to come off sharply in the next three months and if that's the case then the rally in bond markets is overdone and a decent payrolls number could see yields actually edge higher. Um, so if we look at if we look at the 10 year again, I'm just going to bring it back to you. I'll just pull it over here. If we look at the 10 year, um, there does appear it does appear to be finding support in and around just above 205%, 207, 210. So if we change that to a weekly chart. You know, this is where all your analysis tends has a t could could have the potential to blow up in your face. Um, we have seen a significant slide in yield expectations. So for me, if you're looking at 2.5%, which is here around about mid-May, um, to 2.1%, we've come off 40 basis points in addition to the number of basis points that we've come off since the end of last year. So we've dropped a full percentage point in the space of six months. Now, a large part of that may be down to the fact that the Fed is no longer, we are no longer pricing in for Fed rate rises this year. And we are now pricing out any Fed rate rises this year. But pricing out all Fed rate rises this year is a long way from pricing in two rate cuts. And that's really, I think, what I'm looking to try and articulate here. We've gone from four Fed rate rises this year to pricing in two Fed rate cuts. Well, that's an awful lot of a that's an you know that's a big big downward adjustment in expectations in the space of six months. So, are we there yet? I don't think we are, um, because if you're talking about a five percent tariff on Mexican goods, which is due to kick in um, on Monday, if you're talking twenty twenty five percent on US China tariffs again it's a very very small amount of global GDP um, it's not going to make a big dent it might push up inflation expectations but even there you're not seeing higher inflation expectations so um, unless the tariffs go on for a significant amount of time or at the end of this month Donald Trump imposes tariffs on the additional 325 billion dollars of Chinese goods then I think the bond market reaction that we've seen this week is slightly overdone. And as such, we could be due a significant pullback and for yields to push back to 2.2 on the 10 year and towards 2% on the two year. Now, before we get into too much detail, let's have a quick look at some of the key levels on equity markets that I'm looking at this week. If we look at the S&P 500, if we look at the German DAX, if we look at the, F the FTSE 100, they're all pushing back towards their 50 day moving averages. So I think if we get further, to, if we get further gains this week, I think it's unlikely we're going to push much above the 50 day moving average. We've seen some good gains this week. It's going to take something substantial to really push us much higher, simply because the fact that it's unlikely that people are going to want to take long positions into the weekend. We've got G20 finance ministers meeting this weekend in Fukuoka in Japan. 
and the subject on the agenda there is likely to be global trade and it's also likely to be how to tax big multinational corporations like Google and Facebook. We have seen a significant shift in sentiment around the FANG stocks and I think if we do get a big sell-off in the FANG stocks it won't be because of trade it will be because of regulation and regulatory concerns so I think from that point of view we've seen a decent rebound off the 200 day moving average on the S&P we've also seen a similar rebound off the German DAX and that would suggest to me that we could get a retest of not only the 50 day moving average but maybe these peaks here as long as we don't take out these peaks here in May then the downward momentum that we've started or the the slowing momentum that we've seen since the big middle of April the beginning of May is likely to see us continue to trade sideways between these lows here obviously we've got the December lows all the way over here around about 2300 and that's what I was talking about earlier that's really the big level I think for equity market bulls if we drop below either 2500 which was obviously the lows of 2018 which were now above but obviously also these lows here these twin lows in March and the lows here um, 2700 we've got low support 2500 we're a long way from being I'm a, I'm a long way from being overly concerned about a big stock market sell-off at the moment while we're above the key moving averages then I think we are still in what I would call by the dip mode I'm not throwing in the towel yet despite what bond markets are telling us bond markets are telling us that we need to be aware of a warning but bond markets generally tend to be forward-looking indicators it doesn't necessarily mean the sky is going to fall in yet we're talking on bond markets or a two to five to ten year time horizon equity markets looking for three to six months so I think it's important to get a sense of perspective when you're talking in terms of time horizon bond markets are much more forward-looking than say for example stock markets are so I think you have to basically bear that in mind um, when drawing any conclusions so that's the S&P so have a quick look at the uh, FTSE 100 and again here we've got the 50-day moving average acting as a little bit of a barrier on the upside um, we've also got this series of peaks through here around about 73.70, 73.80. So yes, we've seen some good gains this week, a little bit of a pause during the middle of the week. But by and large, we've, we're up five days in a row. Um, I'll be surprised if we push much higher because we've still got this barrier here around about 73.80, which coincides with the peaks here on this left side here and the peaks here on the right hand side here. So that's the FTSE 100. Last but not least, the German DAX. And I think the German DAX is probably the most interesting chart of all because if we look at the daily chart here, we've got a nice little downtrend line, which I talked about, uh, which I talk about in my week ahead video, which should go up by around about 4 p.m. today. Um, we really need to push back above not only the 50 day moving average, but also this resistance line from the highs that I've drawn in here. Let's have a quick look at the dollar. It's also a big day for Canada jobs. Um, so let's just quickly move this over here. These are the key numbers that I'm watching out for. And while I look at the Canada, we're at a key, we're at a key support level in dollar Canada. I'm going to do that first because I want you guys to see this. This is a big, big trend line for dollar CAD. I've drawn this line in from the lows all the way back in 2018 and we've got multiple touches so what are we expecting in terms of Canada jobs well the numbers are um, we're expecting 5,000 new jobs that's a big drop from the 106,000 new jobs that we saw for, ca for Canada in April the unemployment rate is expected to be unchanged at 5.7 and wage growth is expected to weaken slightly from 2.6 to 2.4 so that could be Canada negative which could mean we could see a rally in the US dollar. We're expecting 175,000 new jobs um, for non-farm payrolls, unemployment rates coming at 3.6 and wages to come in at 3.2. Furthermore, the inflation outlook in the US, it's fairly benign, but it's not benign enough to warrant a significant sell-off in uh, uh, yields and, uh, and, and the rebound that we've seen in US bond markets. Quick look on Euro dollar, big, big barrier at 113. So it's going to take a significantly weak dollar number 
to push that through 113.20. If you look at the barrier, we've got 113, 113.20. If we get a move up there, there's big resistance there. It'll take us quite something to get through that level there. So 113.20, big level, more likely to co go back towards 112 uh, than 113. And cable, big resistance coming in, round about 127.40 as we see it right now. Could be a bit of a base forming there. Um, a bit of dollar weakness could see the pound go up to 128.20, 128.30. Otherwise, we could drift back down again. So that's what we're expecting. I'll be quiet now. Um, we can we can digest the overall numbers. 75. So that's a really pretty disappointing number. Um, revision down for the previous number 224, 3.6%, 3 3.1%. So that's actually fairly dollar negative. So watch the upside in euro dollar 113.20. That's the key level. Is it weak? Is it weak enough to push us significantly higher on euro dollar? It could be, but let's not forget that we've got significant resistance here. And also we've got to bear in mind that the ECB has been very dovish this week. So any upside in euro dollar is likely to be constrained by the fact that very weak German economic data, which we saw this morning, is likely to invite further easing from the um, ECB. Furthermore, is this weak enough, this number, is this weak enough to reinforce the case for two rate cuts this year? I would argue it's not. Wage growth is still above 3%. OK, it's a little bit weaker at 3.1. But overall, the unemployment rate is still up. The, you know, very significant lows of 3.6%. Um, and, and as such, um, we could see one rate cut this year, but it certainly doesn't support the case yet for two. So let's have a quick look at dollar yen as well. Probably still squeezing higher on euro dollar. I, I still can't see the justification of seeing it much above 113.20. That's not to say it won't get there, but... Um, I'm still of the opinion that we're in a range trade for euro dollar and likely to remain so. One set of uh, slightly weaker payrolls numbers is not going to change that. With dollar yen, big support around about 107.80, these these series of lows here. Let's see what US yields are doing. They're slightly weaker. US 10-year yield is around about 208. Um, just dropped below 208 on my Bloomberg terminal. So again, the yields, are, the yields are slightly softer, but they're still above the lows of the week. The low of the 10-year yield this week is 2.0590. Um, looking at the two-year yield for this week, the key level to watch out for on the downside on the two-year is, let me see, it's 1.77%. 1.77%. So Canadian jobs numbers slightly better than expected. So what we could see on the Canadian jobs numbers, let's just give a quick recap on that. I only saw the headline number. I didn't see what the wages numbers were. Um, bear with me. So good gains, 27.7 above expectations of five. Unemployment rate on Canada drops to 5.4%. That's a really good number. Um, down from 5.7% and wage growth was maintained at 2.6%. So some fairly good numbers on the Canada, which obviously you would think would send dollar Canada down quite sharply. And sure enough, that's where we've gone. So we're looking down at the 200 day moving average now as our next target for dollar CAD. And in the round, given the fact that we've moved below this trend line on dollar CAD, you would have to think that we're probably going to see over the course of the next few days and weeks further declines in dollar CAD, oil price moves notwithstanding. Not really having that much an effect on equity markets. Um, overall, the FTSE 100 is still around about 73.15. Um, a little bit of dollar weakness heading back towards the lows this week but be paying particular attention to the lows this week to see whether or not we have the potential to weaken further. If I look at my dollar index chart on the Bloomberg it'll probably give me a much better idea of where we're where we're placed with respect to that. Just a quick pause while I just bring up this chart. Bring it over. There we go. So this is my Bloomberg dollar index. If we put in, let's just put in a horizontal line through here. 
So we're looking in and around between 96.60 and 96.70 is a bit of a support area on uh, the Bloomberg dollar index. Now you could argue that there's a little bit of a little bit of a double top forming there. I would start to get a little bit more nervous about dollar downside if we significantly break below that. But overall, um, I would be surprised if that happens today. <laughs> At the moment, the euro is finding, finding it a little bit stodgy around about 1.13.10.20. If we don't come off that in the next, say, for example, hour or two, then I would be a little bit nervous about the euro dollar moving higher. But again, if we move back... If we move back to these these peaks here, uh, you know, unless unless we break above these peaks here, then I would expect the euro to drift back. Um, otherwise, we could get a little bit of stop loss buying back to around about 113 and a half and the 200 day moving average. So I'm keeping a close eye on that. I want to see that come back and move back to around about 112.80, 112.70 over the course of the afternoon. Looking at cable. Um, quickly again, if anyone has got anything else they want me to look at, please feel free to um, shoot me a message um, across the uh, on the on the questions tab. More than happy to answer them. So 127.40.50 on the cable, that's a bit of a level. Why is it a bit of a level? Because it's these series of peaks through here. Could it be forming a bit of a base again? If we break higher, then we could push up towards uh, 128 and and those that those lows that we saw in the middle of April there. Um, looking at Aussie dollar, look at Aussie dollar. Yeah, more than happy to look at gold. Look at that after I've looked at Aussie dollar. There's a big barrier in Aussie dollar around about 70, 20, 70, 30. So um, would certainly look to um, see a retest of 70, 20, 70, 30. But if, unless we go above that, then I would expect Aussie dollar to come back down again to around about 69. Uh, 69.20, 69.30. On the gold price, that's obviously going to prompt um, a potential re. It's actually pot potentially um, pushing gold up towards the highs of the month or the highs of this year. In fact, obviously on the um, on the weaker dollar outlook. But again, here I would be surprised if we break significantly above 13.50 in the short term. And even if we do. Let's look at the peaks from 2018. We're still looking 1365, 1370 overall. Certainly the direction of travel for gold would appear to suggest that uh, the markets are now starting to get a little bit more nervous about um, further downside in equity markets. But I, I'm, st I'm still struggling to see why we would push significantly higher now. If we're at the same stage in a month's time, six weeks' time, then maybe I get more nervous about it. But at these sorts of levels, I would be very reluctant to be long of gold, um, given the resistance and the psychological resistance that we've got around about 1350. We're quite a long way from the long-term support line. Um, yes, we have broken above 1320, so I can certainly see potential to come back to there. But overall, I would expect it to be 1320, um, 1350 over the course of the next few days and weeks. Um, EuroCAD, yep, sure, EuroCAD can certainly look at that. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, you would expect the Euro, you would expect the Canada to strengthen against the euro, but given the way that the dollar is at the moment, it's very the the, two, the do the I'll start again. Given, given the way the dollar is, the, two t the euro and the CAD tend to cancel each other out to a certain extent. And at the moment, given the long shadows on this particular chart, I would suggest that maybe the bias is for euro CAD to drift lower. Um, given that every time we've pushed higher, we've got very long shadows on the candles, which suggests there's plenty of demand to sell euros anywhere near 151. But having said that, if we look over the course of the last few weeks, we haven't really, um, we've really struggled to maintain much below 150. So um, looking at that, it's play the range. You're looking 149, 151, pays your money, it takes your choice. And we're, slap bang, we're almost slap bang in the middle of that, if slightly geared towards the short side. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, Kiwi dollar, yep, can certainly look at Kiwi dollar for you. 
that's going to be a similar story, I think, to the Aussie dollar in terms of we're going with potential to push up towards this series of peaks here around about 66.80. But over and above that, I struggle to see much in the way of upside for Kiwi dollar um, in the same way that I do for the Aussie dollar. Um, there's not really that much. The, the RBNZ um, are likely to remain in dovish mode. They've already set the scene, as has the RBA, uh, with respect to its rate cut earlier this week. And they've certainly got more scope to cut rates than, say, for example, a lot of other central banks have. Um, certainly more scope to cut than the... Uh, uh, than, than or a similar scope to cut than as the Federal Reserve and the RBA. So... For me, this, the break of the 200-day moving average is significant. This area of resistance here is likely to be a tough nut to crack. The oscillator is looking a little bit overbought, but that's not to say that it can't continue to go higher. But you would have to think that based on this, that we'd struggle to get much above 67 cents and could potentially drift back down to the lows that we saw uh, in mid-May around about 65 Getting asked Brent crude. The one elephant in the room with respect to my scenario for a little bit of a rebound in stock markets is crude oil prices. Because if we look at how stock markets have sold off in the past few weeks and how much Brent crude has sold off in the past few weeks, Brent crude has by far been a leading indicator in terms of how um, quickly the market's fallen out of bed. If we look at these two weeks here, they've been very impulsive. For all the talk of OPEC cuts, the market doesn't appear to care that much. Um, and I think that's largely on an expectation that things are likely to get worse when it comes to trade. They're not likely to fall off a cliff, but certainly I think companies' ability to maximise profit margins is likely to take a significant hit on the back of um, higher costs, the cost of higher tariffs and... Um, potential pot potentially higher inflation and I think that's where the problem is at the moment there's no inflation so where are all these higher tariffs costs being absorbed they're being absorbed in the profit margins of companies which means that at some point over the next two to three months we're going to see companies start to downgrade their forward guidance because their ability to raise prices is likely to be constrained by consumer spending just looking at euro dollar, it's starting to edge higher again, and stock markets are starting to edge lower. So, um, certainly a little bit of um, concern on the old uh, sh potential short positions in euro dollar. But again, that 113, 2030 level is, 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 is the level for me. Um, I'm not going to get too concerned about that um, and, until that goes. And then it's really a case of, uh, oh well going home and licking your wins but uh, the dollar index does appear to have broken lower so that is a little bit of a worry um, profit margin costs will be passed on to the consumer surely shortly yeah I mean under normal circumstances Kieran I would agree with you um, at the moment though apart from here in the UK inflation is actually coming lower if you look at the CPI numbers out of Europe this morning not this morning, this week, we saw a big drop um, in core inflation back below 1% to 0.8. It came down from 1.3 to 0.8. Um, and also headline inflation also dropped quite sharply. So for me, the big question is, if they're not showing in the inflation numbers, where is this inflation being absorbed? Um, if they're not passing them on to consumers because they can't, then they're going to have to absorb them in the profit margins and, and if they do pass them on to consumers then surely they're going to show in the inflation numbers and at the moment apart from here in the UK where inflation numbers have edged higher on the back of higher energy costs I haven't seen much evidence of that and one thing I would say is the decline in the oil price could absorb some of the upward pressure on tariffs um, let's not forget in Brent crude we've fallen from $72 a barrel to $63 a barrel so that's eight to nine dollars a barrel that could come off um, fuel prices at the pump so you could get a little bit of a swings and roundabouts effect there um, yeah so for me you're right they could be passed on to the consumer 
but they'll only be passed on if companies feel the consumer is prepared to pay them. Now, at the moment, with wages growing at above 3%, that is possible that consumers have that extra buffer. But then you've got concerns about trade. You've got concerns about Brexit. You've got concerns about China. If you're a consumer, are you going to go out and spend money on big ticket items or are you going to hold something back? Um, when you hear reports of job losses in manufacturing, Ford and what have you, and retailers, I think the headline risk from that probably suppresses to a certain extent consumer sentiment. And we could see that play out next week in the US when we get US retail sales for May. And that's probably what I'm going to move on to now, um, unless anyone has any other questions. Um, you're, you're right, Kieran. You're right, Kieran. Companies won't want to absorb costs indefinitely. You're absolutely right. But if they put their prices up and then can't sell, then they're just going to have unwanted stock, which they're going to have to flog off at discounted rates anyway. So, you, on the off, and you've mentioned borrowing costs for companies. Well, obviously, bond yields are falling as well. So, borrowing costs, you could argue that borrowing costs are falling. So, if borrowing costs are falling, they could actually afford to hold off for a little bit longer in terms of putting prices up. But um, we should get a better idea next week of how China's doing when it comes to retail sales, industrial production and trade, and also US retail sales as well, and UK unemployment and UK wages. Because I think for me here, the, the, the biggest concern I have is a slowdown in wage growth. Now, today we've seen US average earnings slip from 3.2 to 3.1. We've seen Canadian wage growth hold up steady at 2.6%. Um, next week we get UK wages and they're in and around 3.3%. Uh, Unemployment is still around about 3.8%. So unless you start to see wages start to slow significantly um, as a result of the fact that companies aren't prepared to pay their staff more money or the fact they're actually not prepared to pay higher wages to attract the staff they need because this weak number could simply be a result of a tight labour market it may not be as a result of a slowdown in hiring at all or what I would call as an economic slowdown in hiring if we get a weak number next month then I might revisit that but we are seeing a slowdown the big question is how big is it and at the moment I'm not convinced on the basis of one month's numbers so as I say, going back to next week, we've got Chinese retail sales and industrial production for May. Now, I cover that a little bit in my week ahead video, which goes up around about 4 p.m. later today on YouTube. YouTube.com forward slash CMC Markets PLC. Feel free to basically tune into that and listen to what I have to say about Chinese trade and Chinese retail sales. We've also got the Swiss National Bank rate decision next week as well. US retail sales for May on the 14th um, and UK wages and unemployment for April on the 11th. We've also got first quarter sales for Tesco's so that should give us a good indication of how UK consumers are shopping at the supermarkets whether or not Tesco's can continue to um, build on the record profits that we saw last year. So Unless anyone has any other questions, um, yeah, sorry, I was saying Brent crude. Brent crude, you can see I've drawn a horizontal line on there, $64 a barrel. So that's going to be significant resistance there. $64 a barrel, you've got a good base there and a good base there. We ran out of steam today at 64 so it's going to take something substantive to move us higher. We have seen a bullish daily candle, which could see us move above that next week but overall um, I don't think we're going to see Brent crude move above $64 today have to see how it goes um, next week does anyone else have any other questions on anything that we've covered so far um, first time do I do webinars very often um, I do an on-farm payrolls webinar once a month and I do a regular weekly video every Friday, which goes out on the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash CMC Markets PLC. 
there's a wealth of stuff on there um, if you go into the playlists um, there's obviously the um, the main playlist which gets updated fairly regularly two to three times a week we do a chart of the we do a chart of the week um, as and when and and obviously we do we do a week ahead and we do an on-farm payrolls every single month so I will be back here same time next month covering the June payrolls report um, so yes um, that's it I hope you guys found the webinar instructive useful if you did could you please leave a Google review it would be most appreciated um, otherwise I am going to uh, sign off and um, wish you all a great weekend and um, thank you very much for listening